So we'll sing a song which summarizes the glories of Sri Guru. And that song we sing in the morning during the Guru Puja. So that song is written by Srila Narottam Das Thakur. It is called Sri Guru Charana Padma. Those of you, if anyone has song books, for those who don't know this song, it will be good to use song book. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll be explaining a little bit also from this song, because so many very deep, important points about Sri Guru uh, are presented in this song, and the proper mood, how to worship Sri Guru. So, Sri Guru Charana Padama Keva the Bhakati Sadama Sri Guru Okay. 
Shri Nityananda Prabhu Ki Jai Shri Panchatattva Ki Jai Shri Rupa Nuga Guru Varga Ki Jai Shri La Guru Deva Ki Jai Shri La Prabhupada Ki Jai Ananda Koti Vaishna Vrinda Ki Jai Samagata Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai Nitai Gaur Prima Nande Hari Hari
tomorrow again, Maharaji will speak in the morning from quarter to eleven. Today we have up till six, six fifteen maximum, because there is other engagements again. But tomorrow and also the coming week we will try to schedule yeah, more and more. Also we'll have a beautiful opportunity on this coming Saturday, which is Sini Chananda Triodesi. On that day also, we are inviting Maharaji to speak the beautiful Akanda Guru Tattva Nityananda Prabhu, how much you call the origin of all Gurus. Yeah, now I'm giving the floor. I won't take any more time. A uh, warm welcome for Siddhartha Bhakti Vedanta Padmanava Maharas Hare Krishna. Thank uh, Brajanath Prabhu for squeezing me in, <laughs> because, as he said, uh, it was very short notice that I came here. I wasn't sure that I would have the time to come this uh, this year, but um, <clears throat> very glad that I came, and I'm very glad that. Uh, Sri Brajanath Prabhu is organizing this because it is wonderful, very sweet mood amongst the devotees, being able to uh, discuss and share from the heart uh, what we've tried to understand from our gurus and to be together in Jagannath Puri of all wonderful places and to be with senior Vaishnavas and Vaishnavas of all levels and new persons also. I always relish the opportunity to, uh, to meet new devotees because we all were new at one time in Krishna consciousness and uh, it's a very important responsibility that we look after the young ones and we show affection and we try to help as much as we are able to help. So, um, so, uh, I feel unqualified actually to discuss this topic of Guru Tattva. Because, first of all, one has to be a real disciple uh, to understand Guru. And unfortunately, I haven't reached that qualification yet, but I'm hoping in this life or some future life that I'll actually be able to do proper seva to my gurus. But nevertheless, uh, they have given some duty to this fallen soul and to so many and to try our best to represent their teachings. And uh, that is their mercy, because they know that if we try to carry out this instruction with some sincerity, success will be there, for sure. If we are honest and simple-hearted and not duplicit, duplicitous, uh, and we try to, uh, as best we can, uh, represent these personalities, then their mercy will come to us because that's their nature. They're very merciful. We'll talk about this. Sri Guru and His Grace, the, the title of this book is The Mercy of Guru. Uh, and so it's a very interesting subject matter because once you start to open it up, and you start to try to understand and delve into the depth of Sri Guru Tattva, what do you un understand? Well, it's infinite. Uh, it's infinite. Why? Because first of all, what is Guru? And what is Guru Tattva? Guru is none other than Krishna himself. It is his principle uh, of divine mercy 
to rescue all souls who have fallen away from him, who occupy these material universes. They're called the Buddha Jivas, the conditioned souls. And Krishna has a very wonderful pastime that he performs, his Leela, because he's all merciful. So that quality of infinite mercy has to have some objects to receive it. So by Krishna's will, he desires to taste this rasa of showing compassion for the fallen souls. And he himself manifests as Guru. We will discuss this topic. Uh, this principle. How to understand. Uh, on one hand, he is Krishna, uh, Supreme Lord. He's manifesting like an incarnation uh, in apparently a human being of this world. But at the same time, he's not a human being of this world. Real Guru has to be transcendental personality, like the Lord himself. What is a real guru? What are his qualities, his qualifications? What is not a real guru? All of this is explained all throughout the Vedic literatures. It is one of the most covered topics. Because without that, you can't take one step forward, practically speaking. So. It's a wonderful topic that I have the opportunity to uh, give some elucidation on to the best of my ability. Um, I am not an academic person. Uh, it is not my nature to be an academic person, like a professor, like this. Uh, I don't know, I just have a simple-hearted nature that I want to with enthusiasm, uh, try to convey what I understand, what I've experienced, that's all. So I'm also inviting the devotees during this uh, lecture series to also participate, share. Uh, I'm looking out at the audience here and I'm seeing real Guru Sevaks. Uh, like for example, Brajanath Prabhu. I have to say that, you know, in my life, I've rarely seen such dedicated persons to the service of the lotus feet of Guru. Fifteen years, Rajanath Prabhu traveled with our Gurudev right to the final moments here in this room and served him unfailingly. So therefore, he's been blessed with so much realization. And when he expresses that also, it is very profound. And uh, I'm looking at my godbrother back there, Bobadev Prabhu. Bobadev, he was one of the early book distributors in the 1970s, Prabhupada disciple. Did so much sacrifice in Seva. And he's always eager to hear Hari Kata. Because sometimes I visit in Eugene. He stays there, and always he's there, always, through the years. He knows many, many shlokas also. He's very wise, but also very humble. And my other god sister here, Lola Dini, she's also one of the stalwart, wonderful servitors of Prabhupada. She's a Prabhupada disciple for so many years. And just see how she's come all through all these years, to the lotus feet of our Gurudev, Srila Narayan to serve him, to surrender. See? And uh, who else older ones here? Yes. Yes, I, I don't know the history. Yes, I know, but you're a profound disciple? No, no, but also I know you're an older devotee. He is actually responsible for preaching in Germany, yes. Switzerland, Iran, many places. And he is one of the most enthusiastic devotees I have ever met. <laughs> always he is absorbing Kirtan, always. And he is only positive, only positive energy. Never any negative thought or word comes from his mouth. Yeah, his lotus mouth, yeah, because that is 
Lotus. Lotus is Lord. <coughs> so we are very lucky that he is here in our midst and he's also very humble and uh, like I said, always happy. <laughs> so he is disciple of our beloved Guru Day. But even in his con, he was for many years in his con, he has brought many devotees to the shelter of Sri Guru. And now he is constantly continuing his service to bring devotees under the umbrella of Sri Guru Day. So we are very lucky that he has come here with his dear friend, Sri Manohar Prabhu, who is also very responsible and ideal example of devotee disciple. Very sincere and always ready to embrace the ideal teachings of Sri Guru Tattva and Krishna Consciousness. <laughs> and another Mahatma, great soul, has entered the room. The other half of Prajanath Prabhu, Rindadini, who did equal seva. Maybe even more, huh? <laughs> 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 to Srila Gurudev. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I, I could take the whole class just in talking about the devotees who I know here. We also have very senior Vaishnavi here, Lila Madhuri, and her husband Vasu Dhamma. I don't know if he's here yet. They're very old devotees. They came during the communist time in Russia. They had a preaching center in St. Petersburg during the most dangerous time to preach, you see, in the 1980s, you know, very old devotees. And they came and surrendered at the feet of Srila Guru Dev after so many years of service to Krishna. And another Madhusmita Didi from the early 80s. Oh, Vasudham. yes. He's just coming here before yeah. that. Okay. This is Vasudhamma Prabhu, her husband. Yeah. Very wonderful, wonderful seva they've always been doing. Now they're also translating Gurudev's books into Russian language. <laughs> yes, I'm getting this. <laughs> First of all, Mother Smita Didi. I knew her from the early 80s when I was in uh, household life in um, in England, 1982, I believe it was. Manchester. 83 or 84, somewhere around, yeah, 84. And how she has so sincerely and seriously pursued this path of bhakti. Uh, if you examine her life, you'll see that the constant, constant, sincere desire to know what is the pathway, what is the truth. Uh, where should I live? She lives in Vrindavan Dham, last 15 years. Always trying to get very high Sadhu Sangha. She came to the lotus feet of our Gurudev. Uh, even though she didn't meet Srila Prabhupada, she has so much faith in Prabhupada, dedication. So like that. Kamala Kanta Prabhu from Germany. He also, constantly with Gurudev. Always like a shadow. Wherever Gurudev would go, he would try to be there and chanting so sincerely, he does so good sadhana all the time. Uh, he's also a teacher, he can speak also. Uh, yeah, also very good speaker, professional teacher before, now retired. Uh. And now he starts the real teaching, and now Ragaleka. Oh yes, Ragaleka, you can tell. We need a second light. Yeah, also in our midst is Srimati Ramadeka Devi Dosi. Uh, those of you who don't know us, she's sitting there in white Indian dress, yeah, Indian body, yeah, but really how sincere and dedicated she is yeah, to be here also with her husband. Last year she was one of our teachers. Very nice presentation she did on Chaitanya Charita Vrita. And she has been with Srila Gurudev for many, many years before many of us came. Gurudev would stay in their house. Yeah, and in this way, his influence, Gurudev never wanted to leave Vrindavan, but somehow or other, he became <laughs> entangled for our yeah, benefit in those 
those places outside Vrindavan and one of them is Hastinapur or Delhi. Yeah. Especially in Delhi he used to stay in our house. And see and her husband serve all the Vaishnavas yeah, with full dedication. And she is very eager to enter into real bhakti, pure bhakti. And she has also a taste yeah, to go deep into bhakti. She also preaches very nicely in Hindi and England. English. Sorry. She is also teaching in Vajiravati. Now she lives mostly in Vrindavan. Always doing bhajan. Very high class Vaishnavi. We are very lucky that he is in our midst. And if you want to know anything about Guru Tattva, the ladies they can easily approach her. She is always ready to help others. Yeah. Hare Krishna. And then daughter Lakshi. She's also so surrendered to Srila Gurudev. Living here now in Jagannath Puri. Just fully giving up everything, leaving everything behind, family, this, that, and living here on the shore of the ocean at Chakratirtha, uh, always trying to taste the nectar, always very humble, very pure, very sincere. There's so many wonderful Vaishnavas here, and of course, not in this room right now, but Srimati Shamarani Didi. She was one of my first Siksha gurus like 1971, one year after I became a devotee, I came to visit the New York temple. And there she was, sitting there, looked a lot younger then than now, but there she was, sitting there in front of all the, de all the 150 devotees in the temple at that time, every morning practically giving Srimad Bhagavatam class. And she was the senior most to all of us because she came in 1966. <laughs> so. She had had so much personal association with Srila Prabhupada. Now she's writing her memoirs. That will be a great treasure for us to read. Her memories of Prabhupada and her life with Gurudev and everything. And her paintings. And every room, in this world, the bodies, they have the pictures. Yeah. The, by the will of Gurudev, you know, she started painting this first picture here, Seva Kunj picture. And then after that, one after the other, after the other, like dozens. Now she's still sitting there painting right now. And uh, she's one of the, if not the most famous, you know, Krishna consciousness Vaishnavi artist in the entire world, probably. And she's bringing out her paintings book very soon, which also Gurudev wanted. And it will, it will be astonishing. It will go into all different bookshops all over the world and they'll see all these beautiful depictions of the transcendental forms of Radha and Krishna and their associates. More than 300 paintings. Really? Wow. Yeah, from her beginnings. And, and, and if you look, I mean she does a whole presentation on her art herself with slideshow and everything, but if you just look at the difference between when she first came and I was actually reading her notes about how she first started painting, how Prabhupada first engaged her, and it was just on the floor, a canvas, right next to Prabhupada's room, and he would come in and out and look at it, and right from the crude beginnings, very simple, and now, you know, spectacular, beautiful uh, manifestations of the spiritual world. Prabhupada used to call them, these are windows into the spiritual world. So, in this Sangha, hmm? Hmm? well, Snigda, she's not an old devotee, but she's my translator when I travel in, uh, in Russia. And uh, she's also very dedicated um, from the time that she came. I have so many good things to say about her. You know, to look at how she uh, always perseveres with unlimited amounts of translations all day long even though it goes beyond her energy level, but still she's doing. Uh, and La Bangalata, you see, so sincere, one of our, from mainland China, Guangzhou or which place? Guangzhou, yes. And from the beginning, when our preaching began there, she came, and there's so many incredibly wonderful, dedicated, devotees 
who have taken birth there, just so that they can spread this Krishna consciousness movement. Our Gurudev actually physically went there one time, the only Mahabhagwa to enter into mainland China, and hundreds of devotees came. It was very astonishing, you know, Gurudev's preaching mission there. So, and there are so many others like her. Uh, Chinese devotees are very special, very special. They're very determined and very dedicated in Krishna consciousness. And from all countries around the world, Srila Gurudev traveled the length and breadth of the whole world and by the desire of Srila Prabhupada, you know, so what was it, 20 years after Srila Prabhupada requested him in 1977, so then in 1990, so 20 or 30 years? 96. Huh? 96. Yeah, 96. So like Gurudev used to say, uh, Swamiji, or he used to call our Prabhupada Swamiji, very affectionately. Uh, when his Guru Maharaj told him that he should preach this Krishna consciousness movement throughout the whole world, it took him about 30 years. But for me, it only took 20. <laughs> he would say like that. Huh? Yeah, but, but I'm from like 1936, like the final, final instruction, final letter, and Gurudev was calculating from that. So, um, Gurudev has created a wonderful, uh, just indescribably uh, amazing society of devotees all over the world. And of course, he never claimed any credit for doing that because he did not consider that he was doing it. He considered that he was only carrying out the instructions of uh, Srila Prabhupada who requested him to help his devotees and serving the lotus feet of his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Goswami Maharaj. But because he was of that highest caliber, therefore Krishna worked everything through him and uh, he has accomplished what no one has accomplished in terms of giving the final installments that are required for all future generations of Vaishnavas, how they can follow this ultimate pathway to reach the final goal of attaining Braj Prem and very specific types of Braj Prem. He is the Acharya of that. He is like the Rasa Tattva Acharya of the modern day. So this room is very powerful, spiritual room, because this is where he entered into Nityalila, in this place. So a very appropriate place, huh? Right here on this bed. Yes, right here on this bed here. So this is a highly worshipable place, and Guru Tattva is permeating this room and this whole building. Uh, so very wonderful chance to speak about this topic in this location, in this place. So, uh, before I begin, I want to offer my unlimited dandavat pranams and my shuddha pushpanjali at the lotus feet of my beloved Gurudev, Nityalila Pravishta, Om Vishnupad, Astotarasata, Sri Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. And I want to thank him for coming all by himself across the ocean, undergoing great difficulty, even having two heart attacks on the ship. Uh, coming with nothing, no money, just a couple of cases of books on the ship. He had one contact in America and best in some smaller town, some distance from New York City. Uh, but his mission was very urgent, very urgent. And it was the first time that Vaishnavas, a pure Vaishnava, in this line of Lord Chaitanya, had come to give these teachings to the Western world on the other side of the planet. There was an attempt in 1934-35 to send devotees to 
Sarasvati Thakur, sent to Saraswati Thakur, sent to England and to Germany also. So they made some attempt at this. Is that loud enough? <coughs> so they made some attempt, but nothing substantial could be uh, established there. But it was like reconnaissance. In, in military, sometimes they send a soldier to, in a secret way, bring some information about behind the enemy lines called reconnaissance. And they come back and they give this information. So Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj said, what they did was like that. And actually Srila Prabhupada, our Prabhupada, was there when they returned, the first preacher returned back, and they were very interested to hear what he had uh, experienced there. First time, first time since Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared on the earth planet. Uh, they went to the western shores, to England, and the British, were the ones that had conquered over India and were ruling India for more than 200 years, wasn't it? More than 200. Uh, but yet he went there. He sent his disciples there, Srila Prabhupada, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Uh, and they made a little bit of inroads. But the tidal wave of Krishna consciousness was yet to come. And uh, that is why Srila Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati one day was looking uh, in his assembly of his disciples and our A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada when he was a householder at that time, Abhai Charanara Vinda Prabhu was sitting there and there was some discussion about how this will go everywhere and he said, Abhai Prabhu will, will make sure, he, something like that. He, said. he will do everything. He will do everything, yes. Abhay Prabhu will do everything. And at that time, no one could conceive that this householder, businessman, Vaishnava, very good Vaishnava, but in family life and so forth, that he would be the one. And Srila Sridhar Maharaj also was astonished. He said, none of us can conceive how Swami Maharaj has done this miracle, this miracle. They couldn't conceive. So how he came, how Prabhupada struggled for one whole year through the winter of New York City. He had never seen snow before, always being in India. He was 70 years old at the time. And how he wrote these books, it's, it's just uh, epic. You can go on and on and on and tell the histories of this divine personality. And he did it. He fulfilled the desire of his Guru Maharaj. He fulfilled the desire of Bhakti Vinod Thakur to bring this to the whole world. And then in his departing, he indicated, yes, to his leaders of his society, he indicated when they requested him, can you please suggest to us any other personality who we can go to for guidance after you leave? His GBC governing body commissioners, they approached him. And then he told them, yes, you can go to my god brother, Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj. Uh, and this is not the first time that he mentioned him. And it is not the first time that he suggested that the leaders of his society go there for guidance. So actually, at that time, they understood, yes, this is directly Prabhupada's instruction and they followed it for the first year after Prabhupada's departure within a few months time everybody all of them came to Mayapur where uh, they had their first meeting of their GBC after Prabhupada's disappearance and then they formed a committee to follow Prabhupada's instruction and they went across the Ganges River and they visited Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj at his temple there and they inquired from him many, many questions. That was recorded. It was transcribed, his, his harikata, how he answered their questions. And at the time, I was in Mombasa, Kenya, in Africa. 
and this was sent to our little temple there in 1978. And it was also sent to every single temple around the world. And this was the first time that I had read the words of this Vaishnava. I was also present in Prabhupada's room in Vrindavan in 1977 on the evening that he departed from this world. And I was there for more than one month before he left this world. I was going into his room every day, so I was also very aware that Prabhupada had given this instruction. You should go to my godbrother, Bhakti Rakshak Sridharaj. But even prior to that, uh, um, in 1975, two years before that, I was in Los Angeles, and hmm, there was a marathon that we did for two months to produce Prabhupada's books named the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And uh, we somehow or other were managed to do that by Prabhupada's instruction, by forming 24-hour shift of editors and proofreaders and layout artists and all of this. Shamrani knows she was there in that marathon. And um, then after, the, after this was completed, Prabhupada was very pleased by this. And then he was asked by one of his GBC members, which book will you translate after this? Uh, if, because now you're going so quickly, maybe you'll complete the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, in your life span. So if you do that, will you translate Mahabharata or Vedanta Sutra or some other you know, important Vedic literature? And then his response to that, Srila Prabhupada's response was that, uh, no, those books are not as important to us in terms of bhakti as the books of our Goswamis and the books of our Acharyas in, the, in this line like Bhakti Vinod Thakur and so forth. He said all those books should be translated. Then he asked him the question to Prabhupada, is there anything, is there any other person, suppose that you are not able to complete the Srimad Bhagavatam and you depart from this world before that, is there any other person who can complete this work. And then, and I remember reading this. I've told this story many, many times because it's the basis of my going to see Srila Sridhar Maharaj in the beginning. But, I, uh, but at that time, I'm standing there. It was a bulletin board outside of the ISKCON Los Angeles temple, and it had this newsletter right there. And, it's, and Prabhupada's answer to this question was, there are only two persons living on the planet today who can write purports to the Srimad Bhagavatam in English language. That is myself and my god brother, Bhakti Rakshak Sri Dharma. So when I read that, I said, oh, okay. And a few years before that, in 1972, I was able to hear uh, some recording of Srila Prabhupada and Srila Sri Dharma speaking together. And then I became aware that Prabhupada has this particular godbrother, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj. So there's a long history of Prabhupada's relationship with Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj, who became my second instructing spiritual master Siksha Guru after Prabhupada departed from this world. So I'm offering my unlimited Dandavat pranams at his divine lotus feet. He is the one who has spoken the topics that are we are going to discuss from this book, Sri Guru and His Grace. And some of those dialogues were actually spoken to some of the ISKCON leaders, where they asked him various questions. And uh, when Srila Sridhar Maharaj was about to depart from this world in 1988, then uh, I had the opportunity in the early part of 1988 to come to India. And I had the opportunity to uh, visit with one personality who I had seen at the time when my Prabhupada was departing from this world because he was there on that evening. And from that time till 11 years later, I was always attracted to him thinking that, oh, he is such a wonderful Vaishnava, I should meet him. I hope that I can meet him one day. And that is our Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj. So in 1988, 
by the mercy of one of my god brothers, Prabh Kishore Prabhu, and uh, his friend at that time, Uddhava Prabhu. They were collecting money to build Gurudev's temple in uh, Rup Sanatan temple in Vrindavan. I had helped them to, uh, to some extent. And then he called me up and said, how would you like a free ticket to India? And I said, yes, but what's, what's, the, uh, what's the catch? <laughs> he said, no, just, just we need someone to bring money physically across to India. Because in those days you couldn't send the money through banks and stuff. And it has to be changed on the black market also, which is quite dangerous when you're carrying huge amounts of money. <coughs> but they, they said, we, we need someone we can fully trust. So, And you've always wanted to meet Srila Narayan Maharaj, because Pran Kishore had already known him for something like seven years before that. So I was very happy. And I came here to India in 1988. And I came directly after changing the money in the black market in Delhi, then I came directly to the Sri Kesha Tigodiyamat in Mathura, where Srila Narayan Raj always stayed. And I was very fortunate to meet him at that time, and uh, it was very wonderful. I spent three days with him before I proceeded to Navadvip Dham to see my Siksha Guru Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj. So in that first meeting in 1988, was my real opportunity to personally uh, associate with Srila Narayan Maharaj. And I had such a wonderful experience, and I was also able to go on Parikrama with him to Radha Kund and Govardhan by the merciful arrangement of the Lord. They were going the very next day with some Mathura Vasis. Maybe even Raga Lanka was there, I don't know. 1988. Not yet, okay. So, um, so then I asked him some questions one day uh, on my final day with him. And I even recorded it, but that recording was lost many years ago. But uh, it was recorded in my heart how, how he was so, um, so concerned and, you know, so on a very personal level. He, ex he showed me, he expressed to me how he wanted to help me. And so that solidified my relationship with him. And from that point, I now began meditating upon him as another personality who would be my Siksha Guru, who I could go to for guidance like this. And then that, later that same year, Srila Sridhar Maharaj departed from this world and went into Nityavila. So from that point, I had this association with Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj. Uh, I came in 1991 and briefly met him. But finally in 1994, uh, along with Pran Kishore and others, and actually that was the first time that I met Rajanath Prabhu and Vrinda Didi, because I think it was your first Parikrama also that year, 94? 93. 93. 92, Braj Mandala Parikrama. You went on whole Parikrama? 93 was your first complete program. Okay. So, and it was the beginning of something that none of us could really conceive of at that time, <laughs> what would take place, but I have a whole story that I tell also of how I realized, you know, it was gradually coming to me, but how I realized the, how exalted personality Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj is. And uh, at that point, there was no other alternative except to try before it's too late. Now, this is the third Mahabhagwat. So before it's too late, I have to try my best to always be with this Vaishnava. And at that time, none of us could conceive that Srila Gurudev would actually go to the West. But Brajanath Prabhu and uh, Gopinath Prabhu, they were making some kind of plans in the background. And to my surprise, in 1996, just at around the same time when another great Vaishnava, Srila Gauravinda Maharaj, departed from this world suddenly, uh, without any notice, and many of his disciples at that time, uh, they were shocked that he was departing from this world. I was actually in Taiwan when I got this news. 
Pran Kishore called me up and told me, he said, I have this some news to give you. He said, a great Vaishnava has departed from this world. And I said, oh, is that? He says, Shri Lamarkovinda Maharaj. And we had been associating in Malaysia with, their, with his disciples for almost a year. And we were hearing so much about his glories from them. So then after that he said, but I have some other news also. I said, well, what's that? He says, are you sitting down? I said, yes. He said, Guru Dave is coming to the West. I said, you're kidding. He's coming to the West? Where? When? <laughs> he said, he's coming, what, in April or May? Uh, first to Holland, then to England, and then to his coming to America. I said, oh, it's amazing. Then he said, are you going on the tour? I said, yes. <laughs> so that began, you know, and that began the beginning of something that has never ended. <laughs> Constantly touring around the world, you know, trying to be under the guidance of a pure devotee of Krishna. And that episode, that history, it will be recounted by devotees. Many devotees still have to write their books uh, and uh, make their videos of their memories of Srila Gurudev and you know, what they experienced in his presence all through all these years. So, you know, that divine personality, Srila Gurudev, he saved my spiritual life. I told him that when he gave me sannyas in 2002. I just said to him, I said, Gurudev, you've saved me. And he said, yes, I've saved you. <laughs> <laughs> so he pulled me out and he engaged me in doing some service, however inadequate I've always been. But he is so merciful. And devotees all over the world, they know this. <coughs> devotees all over the world have experienced this. You know. And they're all doing their sadhan bhajan every day uh, to the best of their ability, trying to be good disciples of Gurudev. Gurudev wanted this mission to continue. So, like this, we are nothing but the products of mercy. Uh, Sri Guru and His grace, you see. So if we want to please our Gurudev, which is the only means for a disciple to attain Krishna's mercy, then we will have to try to know His heart. Isn't it? Gurudev, I was reading one post some devotee put up recently on Facebook. And it was a quote of Gurudev. wish I could, would have, have it in front of me right now. But he said, the only way, really, to please Guru is to worship his Ishtadev as he does. You see? That's what he wants. He has come to implant in your heart what is in his heart. You see? Nothing less than that. He has come to turn you into a pure devotee and in a particular mood, in a particular rasa with Krishna. And Gurudev made that very specific in his preaching mission. You see. So we try to please Guru by following, and, and he's always pleased to some extent by the smallest effort that his disciples make. That's why mercy comes. Without that mercy, just like for the little child, you know, the parents cannot expect that the little child will suddenly be able to, to walk and talk and do everything. But they're very patient with the child, you know? Very loving, very affectionate. They even uh, see all the mistakes that the child makes, but they take, they take pleasure, actually, in seeing their mistakes because they know that they're trying and one day they're going to succeed. One day that child is going to be able to actually walk on his own feet, you see. So Guru is like that, actually. Guru is like that. He is like the most loving father. And 
when he takes charge of a jiva, uh, of their soul, of their atma, he tries to bring them very close to his heart and to give them uh, what is in his heart. How does he do that? Through his harikata and through his instructions, his personal instructions that he gives to the indi individual disciple and through also his harikata, all the instructions from all of our shastras, from all of our guru parampara. And when the disciple hears, then his bhakti awakens. If that was not the fact, none of us could be here now. If that was not the fact, Srila Prabhupada could not have started the entire worldwide Krishna consciousness movement. If the mercy of Guru did not flow through his words, through his harikata, if that sound vibration was not 100% pure Shabda Brahma and full of all divine potency, there would be no way that the conditioned souls can take up the process of bhakti. So, Sri Guru is indispensable necessity. Indispensable. No one can approach the absolute truth except through his agent. This is something that a lot of people don't understand in today's world and in every era. Uh, they overlook this. Some people think that, well, I can just practice yoga and meditation and realize the divine, the supreme, the all one, the formless. The, they have so many nomenclatures. Uh, or even, I can realize Krishna just by taking up the process and chanting Hare Krishna mantra and reading the Shastras like this, and I can realize Krishna. Uh, but I don't need Guru. Why do I need Guru? Krishna is in my heart. Krishna is in my heart. Uh, why do I need Guru? Uh, this is some unnecessary intermediary. Uh, I'll just go straight. Straight to the Lord, straight to God, straight to the Supreme. But in actuality, that's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because you're not qualified. Uh, you're not qualified to see Krishna. You're not qualified to directly meet Krishna. He's the eternal, absolute, supreme being uh, who is the source of everything that exists. All infinite number of living beings are coming from Him. Uh, his tattva is inconceivable. It is true that He is within our heart. That is a fact. He is within our heart. But you can't perceive Him. Conditioned soul does not have the power to communicate with the Super Soul, the Paramatma. That is told in the first chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Conditioned souls are incapable of perceiving uh, the Lord's uh, instructions. However, He is there. He is called Chaitya Guru. Chaitya means within the heart, within our Atma, within our soul. He is sitting side by side with us. This is the most amazing revelation in the Vedic literatures. That as we travel from one body to another, and we wander all throughout this universe, taking different species of life even, huh? Huh? it is called Brahmanda Brahmite, wandering in the universe. This goes on for endless millions of lifetimes. In millions of species of life even, each one of us sitting here right now in our nice male or female human form, we've had millions of other bodies. In all the different species, we've crawled on the ground as insects. We've swam in the ocean as all different aquatic species. 
We've, we've flown in the air in all different birds species. We've been in all different animal species. And probably we've taken many human births before as well. But the Lord, Krishna, He has never left us. From our entrance within material existence, He has never left us. He is always with us side by side. But we cannot realize that on our own. Therefore, Sri Krishna, the guru within our heart, he manifests outwardly in the form of what? A very great devotee, Mahanta Swarupa, a very great devotee of Krishna, very great Vaishnava. This is Krishna's manifestation. Huh? It is not that he is Krishna, because there's a difference. The Mayavadi gurus like to say, I'm God. And you take this mantra from me, you meditate, and you'll become God also, you'll realize you're God. Which is the most ludicrous, absurd suggestion that could ever be put forward. And our acharyas, all of the, like this morning and yesterday morning, you heard about our acharyas like Madhvacharya, Ramanuj, they have all written extensively uh, tremendous uh, elucidations and refutations of every single point that these uh, bogus Mayavadis have made and fully, fully defeated them. Uh, but yet, it goes on in Kali Yuga, everywhere, because people are innocent and they have no knowledge, so very easily they can be misled. That is the nature of the Kali Yuga. In previous Yugas, there was authorized Vedic knowledge coming down, huh? and people had access to this in previous Yugas. There were also demoniac forces in previous Yugas, but uh, the Vedic knowledge was and Vedic civilization was spread everywhere. But in Kali Yuga, it has become very degraded civilization. Yavana, Malecha, uh, that means those who eat meat, those who are completely outside of the Vedic culture. The whole world is like that now. So the Kali Yuga is a very dangerous and difficult time. And that is why the Supreme Lord Krishna becomes the most merciful in the Kali Yuga, because if he did not, the Jivas would not have any chance at <coughs> to attain their eternal relationship with the Absolute Lord. So, the Mahanta Swarup, the Guru manifesting outwardly, is the most merciful manifestation of Krishna. No other manifestation can compare to this mercy. It is, it is described that when Krishna's mercy, ocean of mercy, becomes very condensed, very thick, then at that time he manifests as Sri Guru. And because Krishna knows everything, he's all-knowing, and he's everywhere, and he's within everyone's heart, and he knows how to bring the conditioned souls gradually to him. So he engages the conditioned souls in acquiring Sukriti, pious credits from previous lifetimes. Even in animal species, he gives them, like here, dogs are eating Jagannath Mahaprasadam, or they're hearing Kirtan. So that dog gets Sukriti. It doesn't matter that he's not in the human body, he gets Sukriti. And that Sukriti accumulates. And when that Sukriti accumulates more and more, then that Jiva takes birth in human form, and he has the tendency to associate with saintly persons, transcendentalists, and Krishna arranges that they will meet together. That is the most amazing histories. How the jivas have come for millions of lives and how Krishna is bringing them now finally to meet the pure devotee. You see, I was telling some of our new devotees the other day that I always like to hear the story, how did you come to Krishna? How did you meet Krishna in your life? Please tell me. And every time I ask this, I find out that it's extraordinary, you know? And I can see, and they can also see how Krishna moved and directed things in their life. Each one of us have our own story, you see? 
And even after that, we have so many stories. After meeting Sri Guru in our life, you see. So, I, what is the time that we... Five more minutes. Five more minutes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> For today. Yeah. Tomorrow we can. Yeah, we'll continue tomorrow. So, so why is this Guru Tattva, why is this subject matter so important for us? Because without developing our relationship with Guru, we can never develop our relationship with Krishna. It's not possible. It's just not possible to go to Krishna except through his agents. And he himself demonstrates this even when he incarnates in this world. When Krishna comes as an incarnation, he always demonstrates that he himself accepts a bona fide guru who is a very great Vaishnava and a great, very great devotee of himself. He teaches that by his own example, you see? And he himself propounds the Vedic knowledge all throughout the world. He also takes the position of guru in many, many different incarnations and speaks the Vedic knowledge. And then he empowers you know, innumerable Vaishnavas on planets all throughout the universe. Huh? He empowers them to disseminate this knowledge. So in actuality, Krishna is the only Guru. This point is going to be explained more in our next class. Because Krishna tells this fact to his most exalted devotee Uddhava in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And he says to Uddhava, all oh Uddhava, you should know that in actuality, it is I who am the Acharya. Acharya Mam Vijanya. You should understand, I am the Acharya. Navamanyeta Karhichit. And you should never disrespect that Acharya because he's non different than myself. I have appeared as the Acharya. So, what is this appearance? What is this appearance? It is called Guru Tattva, Shri Guru. The principle called Shri Guru. And that principle is Krishna himself. Because no one can deliver the conditioned souls except Krishna. No one can deliver them. So therefore, he is doing that work. But the method through which he does it is through the sadhus, through the shastras, and through Guru. These three. Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. The Vedic literatures, the saintly persons who are the living example of the Vedic literatures, and the Guru who enlightens the conditioned soul and takes full responsibility for them to bring them to the spiritual world. You see. So this principle of Sri Guru is the most merciful manifestation. And Uddhava told that to Krishna. He told that at the end of Krishna's entire discourse, something like 24 chapters in the 11th canto, Krishna is speaking to Uddhava. Yeah? It's the longest discourse in the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. He's speaking to Uddhava. And at the end of that, Uddhava is just astonished. And he prays to Krishna, Naivo payantya pachitam kavayastavesha uh, he says, Oh my Lord, uh, the greatest poets, the greatest learned scholars and sages, even if they could have the lifetime of Lord Brahma, okay, that's trillions of years. Uh, the other day, Tridani Maharaj was telling us about the divisions of time in the universe. Lord Brahma lives for trillions of years. So Uddhava says to Krishna, Oh my Lord, if even those poets and those scholars were able to have the lifetime of Brahma, they could never ever express fully their gratitude to you. Why? Because you appear in two forms to deliver the jivas from this material world. One as the Chaitya Guru within the heart and the other as the great devotee, the pure Vaishnava, Sri Guru. So, there are so many wonderful shlokas. We have a whole shloka book with pages and pages and pages uh, telling about Guru Tattva and uh, all different aspects of Guru Tattva. 
and we have this book that I'm going to be reading from, Sri Guru and His Grace. Uh, in very incredible, penetrating ways, Srila Sridhar Maharaj clearly explains every single topic that is connected with Sri Guru, and that is very necessary because devotees were very confused also, especially after Prabhupada departed from this world, and he clarified everything. Chaitanya Charitamrita, first chapter, subject matter of Guru. The very first word in Chaitanya Charitamrita is what? Bande Gurun. <laughs> Gurun means plural number, gurus. Uh, because why? Because Guru is manifestation of Krishna. But first of all, we approach Guru, and then we try to worship Krishna. So, so much more to say. Now it has clicked one minute past <coughs> the end time for today. So, is it okay if I ask for like one question or anything? Just five minutes? Or we should finish? Huh? Okay, so I'll, I'll just take briefly, if anybody has a question that they would like to ask, we will give a very succinct and short answer. But if you want to save that question, we'll also give a chance tomorrow. I would like to yeah. elaborate more yeah. and get from you and other devotees the necessity of accepting Guru. Yeah. Because this is a big problem for yeah. everyone in this world. Yeah. But if we can explain it and hear from each other what is our realization, it will be very, very helpful because it is really not complicated. But my journey is important. Yeah. yeah. Because without accepting, if we don't accept, there is no progress on our part. You must fully 100% accept. is making a very essential point, and I and I actually that's going to be one of the uh, very central topics because I'll read what Srila Sridhar Maharaj is telling about that, the acceptance of Guru, why to accept Guru, uh, all the topics connected with that, and it is true that your spiritual life really begins when you accept Guru. Before that, you're executing Sukritis. You can do, and you're getting credit for it. But actual acceptance by Krishna comes when his devotee accepts you. And that is the beginning of your real spiritual life. Uh, and it may take even more than one lifetime. But in every life, one has to accept Sri Guru and one has to surrender. Uh, how Krishna is telling in the Bhagavad Gita, I'll explain all that. How Krishna tells that you have to surrender to Sri Guru. What does surrender mean? That's a very big topic. What is surrender? Because there's many persons who outwardly accept Guru, or they get initiated by Guru, but then they don't follow. They don't surrender. So what is their actual relationship with that Guru? How deep is it? How real is it? All these factors are there. So, no question. I take yes. So the devotee without guru physically, how can we serve the guru in the heart in the meantime? Yes. By following the instruction, by being in the association of the devotees, uh, you are preparing. It's kind of like when you want to plant a seed. Before you can plant that seed, you have to till the soil. You see, you have to prepare. So everything is beneficial. I actually, you know, when I came, became a devotee, um, my spiritual master, Shiva Prabhupada, he had left India, like one week after, uh, left America to go to India. He was gone for an entire year, and during that year, we also didn't even know if he was gonna return. There were some rumors. He was also very old at the time. And, and by following his instructions, by chanting, every day, we went out on Nam Samkirtan, six hours every day in Chicago, in Detroit, and even in the winter time, and we were there chanting, chanting the Maha Mantra, six hours a day. And then the rest of the time, we would be at the temple with classes and artiks and prasadam and reading his books and all of this. And within a very short time, 
I had very powerful experiences in my heart of meeting Srila Prabhupada, even though I'd never physically met him. And so I had to wait an entire year before he came back to America. And that was a very joyous occasion. And then, by his mercy, I was accepted as his disciple, you know, at the age of, uh, like after one year, 19 years old, I was accepted as his disciple. Then I had to wait another year to get second initiation, Diksha, you see. So, but there are devotees that have waited for many years. Even Srila Prabhupada himself, he met his spiritual master in 1921, but he didn't take initiation until 1932, I think it was, in Radha Kunda. But he said, from the moment that he met his guru, Maharaj, he said, I was always thinking about him, always thinking about him. I have met such a saintly person. Oh, this is the person in whose hands the movement of Lord Chaitanya is going to go everywhere. He had this faith in him. And he said, in actuality, I was initiated by him, he said. So the initiation is a formal thing. But the acceptance and the heart connection and all of that, that is developing, you see. So whether you have met that person who will be your guru or whether you haven't yet met physically that person, but Krishna already has his plan and nothing is happening by chance, you see. So our only uh, necessity is to be very, very sincere. Very sincere, like I told the other day. Srila Sridhar Maharaj said, sincerity is invincible. <laughs> invincible. Uh, it's the all-powerful element, sincerity. So if we're just sincere and we try humbly to really take in everything, then we're well on our way. See? So the initiation will come, definitely. Yeah? And shelter at the feet of Sri Guru will come. Uh, there are many stories that devotees can tell, especially the older devotees, about so many different uh, levels of gurus, and some gurus were not very successful in their attempt to be guru, and all of these things. But there are always qualified Vaishnavas in this world who Krishna arranges to help his conditioned souls. So, uh, guru is waiting, uh, and uh, that will be apparent in your own heart uh, when you're hearing from that guru, that person. And one thing, I'll just end with this now. Uh, there's a lot to tell about Srila Sridhar Maharaj's instructions regarding guru and guru tattva and levels of gurus and all of that. But he said that it's, it's a very uh, wonderful thing how Sri Krishna arranges for particular souls to meet particular uh, Vaishnavas who are gurus. And when that soul meets a particular Vaishnava, they will feel, even though they can see that there are other qualified Vaishnavas, but they will be particularly attracted toward a particular Vaishnava to accept them as their guru, and they will feel, oh my, for me, for me, my guru is the best. They will feel like that. And why is that? Because this is called Guru Tattva. Krishna is arranging. Krishna is arranging like that. But in order to progress to the highest level, we will have to, in one lifetime or another, or more than one lifetime, we'll have to come to the lotus feet of the topmost Vaishnava, the Uttam Vaishnava. And we'll have to take shelter there. We'll have to hear there from that personality. And even Srila Gurudev told that uh, even if a devotee takes initiation from a guru who is not of that level, let's say, but very sincere Vaishnava, that guru will so much desire that his disciples will get the association of this great personality. That will be the symptom of a bona fide guru. And he himself will say, yes, I will also go there to hear from him. Yes, you should go. And in this, play, in this way, there's no obstruction. And everything will flow, and that, that great Vaishnava personality will become Siksha Guru, and even your Diksha will be received through him, because cause actually without Siksha, Diksha doesn't become completed. That's a whole topic. We'll also discuss that. What is Diksha? How is the Diksha completed? It must be completed through Siksha. 
and it has to be of the highest level. So, so much to tell. Rajanath Prabhu is also very, very expert in this topic of talking about Guru Tattva, qualifications of Guru and all of this. So, I'm ending here on this evening, bowing down at the lotus feet of my Gurus, all of my Rupanuga Guru Varga, praying at their lotus feet that they will shower their causeless mercy on all of us so that we can become real disciples and pure Vaishnavas uh, in this life and uh, we can actually do service to their lotus feet. Gaur Premanam Vedi Vanchar Kalpataru Vesha Kripa Sindhu Vyeva Cha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Shri Guru Tattva Ki Shri Guru Deva Ki Shri Prabhupada Ki Shri Rupanuga Guru Varga Ki Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Nitai Gaur Premanam Vedi Bhakti Varanda Padmanava Maharaj Ki Shri Guru Tattva 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 Ki